LeBron James has been on his share of good teams, and his share of bad ones as well. Before LeBron was even drafted, his future teammates on the Cleveland Cavaliers were doubting him, but the doubt was soon extinguished, and as LeBron began to prove himself in the league as one of the greatest players of all time, players that were superstars themselves saw the benefit of LeBron James joining their squad, and LeBron felt the same way. LeBron needed to give his sore back a break from carrying some absolute trash teams to deep playoff runs. And that's when he gave one of the most historic interviews of all time, The Decision. The answer to the question everybody wants to know. LeBron, what's your decision? Um, in this fall, man, it's, it's, it's very tough. Um, in this fall, I'm going to take my talents to South Beach and um, join the Miami Heat. Ever since The Decision, LeBron has been on some pretty good teams. A combination of signing with the right teams and bringing in the right players is a major part of LeBron's success. But in one season, LeBron assembled a team with past MVPs, runner-up MVPs, championship winners, and other great players. And it didn't go anywhere close to as planned. The 2017-2018 Cleveland Cavaliers were quite an interesting team. Coming off of three straight NBA Finals matchups with the Golden State Warriors dynasty, LeBron was depleted. He had stars such as Kyrie Irving and Kevin Love, and some other pretty good players too, but they were just no match for the Golden State Warriors, who had Stephen Curry, Klay Thompson, and Draymond Green. Especially when the Warriors added Kevin Durant in 2016, it was over for LeBron. LeBron was carrying the Cavaliers, putting up some of the craziest numbers in NBA Finals history and still getting crushed by the absolutely stacked Warriors. The Cavaliers needed more, and LeBron, I mean the Cavaliers front office, would go on a big recruiting spree. These are the players in the Cavaliers roster by the 2017 NBA Finals. Players such as Kyrie Irving, Kevin Love, Tristan Thompson, Kyle Korver, and J.R. Smith were on the team. But let's look at how the roster changed after the 2017 Finals to the next season, and how this would help LeBron on his quest to defeat the Golden State Warriors and assemble a super team of his own. On July 10th, 2017, the Cavaliers added Jose Calderon, an experienced point guard that was a good shooter. Calderon had the NBA record for highest free throw percentage in a season, and this was the type of guy LeBron needed, someone who was smart with the ball and could hit shots when they mattered most. On the 11th of July, the Cavaliers signed Jeff Green, another solid player who put up over 10 points per game in every year in his career. The Cavs was Green's seventh team, so he knew how to quickly get acquainted with his teammates. The next day, on July 12th, the Cavs re-signed Kyle Korver, one of the best three-point shooters of all time. He's fourth on the all-time three-pointers made list. Korver had some experience playing with LeBron and was a solid part of the Cavs team as he could easily hit threes at an extremely high percentage. A couple days later, on July the 18th, the Cavs signed C.D. Oseman, a first-year player in the NBA who was relatively unknown. A couple days after the signing of C.D. Oseman, breaking news broke that Kyrie Irving wanted out of Cleveland, an extremely strange and shocking turn of events. Irving wanted to be a superstar with his own team, not living under the shadow of LeBron. This was one of the craziest stories at the time. LeBron always treated Kyrie great and never talked negatively about him and defended him constantly in the media. Going to the finals in three straight seasons wasn't enough. Kyrie wanted more, and the impact of this decision would cause a disastrous, rippling effect. LeBron would now have to carry more of the weight for his team, and extend his arms to other players that wanted to join him on his quest to take down the Warriors dynasty. Before this point, Kyrie and LeBron had a good relationship, and even though the Cavaliers were outmatched, they probably could have added one star and been pretty close to beating the Warriors and maybe even beat them. But now that Kyrie left, it really ruined all that team chemistry. They needed a new point guard, and they needed a couple more stars. So this made it extremely tough for LeBron, and he needed to start recruiting. So a couple of days after the Kyrie Irving news broke, the Cavaliers signed Derrick Rose. Rose won the Rookie of the Year award, and then was the youngest MVP in NBA history, two seasons after that. Sadly for Rose, his quick and electric style of play was derailed by a career-altering ACL injury. Rose was still a good player after his injury, averaging 15 points and almost 5 rebounds for the years between his injuries and the time he joined the Cavs. Although he wasn't the MVP player he once was, 
Rose was a solid player that could add experience, maturity, and good play to the Cavaliers, who now desperately needed a point guard. After the signing of Derrick Rose, nothing happened for over a month. And then the Kyrie Irving trade happened. The Cavaliers traded Irving for Isaiah Thomas, Jay Crowder, and T. Zizek, a first-round pick, which ended up being Colin Sexton the next year, and a second-round pick. Now this was a juicy trade, one that would not only shake up the Cavs, but also the Celtics. Isaiah Thomas was scoring nearly 30 points a game and was fifth in MVP voting the previous season. He led the Celtics all the way to the Eastern Conference, but he got a hip injury, which forced him to miss the remainder of the playoffs. To put things short, the city of Boston and Isaiah Thomas himself were shocked and betrayed with his trade because of how much heart Thomas put towards the city of Boston. For Cleveland, however, they just got rid of a thorn in their side and replaced it with one of the top players in the league and a solid player that could score and maybe even start for the team. And you could make a legitimate argument at the time about whether Thomas was better than Kyrie. Soon after the blockbuster trade, the Cavaliers signed John Holland to a two-way contract with their development team, and he didn't really play with the Cavs much that season. Just before the preseason, on September 25th, they signed Kendrick Perkins, who was a starter on the 2008 Boston Celtics Big 3 team that won an NBA championship. This was a solid pickup because the Cavs had even more championship experience with a player that has always been solid for their team. The day after the Perkins signing, they signed Ja'Cory Williams, who never played a professional basketball game and was released the very next day. Quite rude, I'd say. Maybe he got some money from it, so that would be cool, but imagine getting a call that you're going to be playing with LeBron James, knowing that you're probably going to an NBA championship, something that you've worked for your entire life, just to have your hopes and dreams crushed the very next day. But we go on. Maybe the reason that Williams was released was because the Cavs were making way for another player that brought a little more value to the team, Dwayne Wade. Wade, a 13-time All-Star, 3-time champion, 1-time scoring leader, 1-time Finals MVP, and many other achievements, was a huge add-on to the Cavs. Wade knew exactly what it took to be an NBA champion, and he even had championship experience with LeBron. The first two championships that LeBron had was when he went over to the Miami Heat to play with Dwayne Wade. And now Wade was returning the favor, coming to LeBron's team to help bring a championship to Cleveland. Okay, maybe it wasn't as appealing as I'm making it seem, because at one point in Wade's career, he was Finals MVP material, averaging over 30 points per game. But by the time he was playing with the Cavs, his output was quite a bit less. With a continuous decline through the years, Wade was averaging about 30 minutes and 18 points a game. These definitely aren't bad stats. I'm just saying that Wade was now quite different of a player than he was in his prime. But still, he had the chemistry and the ability to perform better than most players in the league. So that's better than most. Once the preseason started, the Cavs signed Isaac Hamilton, who was another player that never played professionally and would later be released before ever playing a game. The same day they released Hamilton, they released Eddie Taveras, a 7'3 center that played one game for them the previous season, and it doesn't seem like his short NBA career ever recovered. Now, three days before the season started, the Cavaliers traded away Kay Felder, Richard Jefferson, two second-round picks, and $3 million of cash for two players that never played in the NBA and would never play a game. Felder just finished his rookie season with the Cavs, where he didn't do much for the team, And Richard Jefferson, on the other hand, won a championship with the Cavs in 2016 when they came back from a 3-1 deficit. He was a league veteran, but I guess maybe LeBron was just sick of him, so he forced the Cavaliers' front office to just send Jefferson out and give the team that took him an extra $3 million just for their troubles. Jefferson's basketball career never recovered. That same day that Richard Jefferson was traded, they released Kendrick Perkins, after only having him for about three weeks. So Perkins didn't end up actually playing game with the Cavs, but they did have a couple other centers on the team, and Perkins definitely wasn't in his prime, so it was kind of understandable. Although at this point, it does seem kind of strange because they're picking up and releasing guys like crazy. On the 19th of October, which was one day into the season, they signed London Parentes to a two-way contract with their development league team, and he didn't really end up adding much to the Cavaliers. For the next three months, all the Cavs did was send and recall C.D. Osman and Antti Zizek to and from the Development League team, the Canton Charge. During that time, they assigned Isaiah Thomas to the D-League and recalled him from it on the same day. Nothing then happened until the trade deadline, February 8th. Up to this point, the Cavaliers' record was 31-22, compared to their 37-16 record the year before at the same point. 
It was clear that even with tons of added help, the Cavs had some big problems. The hole that Kyrie left could simply not be filled with a bunch of stars. And as the trade deadline was nearing, the Cavaliers would make some big moves to try and fix the problems with their roster. And maybe the biggest overhaul of a roster in one day, the Cavaliers got rid of Dwayne Wade, Channing Frye, Isaiah Thomas, Jay Crowder, Derrick Rose, Demetrius Agravanus, Iman Trumpert, $2.1 million of cash, a first round pick, and two second round picks across various trades, and they received Jordan Clarkson, Larry Nance Jr., Arturis Gadotis, George Hill, Rodney Hood, and a second round pick. Now I'm not going to go deep into every single player that was a part of these trades, I'm just going to look at some of the main points of the trade. Isaiah Thomas started in almost every game he played with the Cavs, averaging about 15 points and 5 assists per game. So I don't really know why he was traded, but I think they should have just given him a little more time, especially since he was still recovering from his hip injury. Isaiah Thomas' career never really recovered from that trade. Dwayne Wade was averaging a bit over 20 minutes a game for the Cavaliers and was scoring over 10 points per game. I think they could have kept him on that team and maybe just not play him as much because all they received in exchange for Wade was a second round pick. Derrick Rose, Channing Fry, and Jay Crowder were also contributing to the team as well, but not in a significant way. With so many players that were either superstars or pretty good players, it's hard for players to learn their new role, get chemistry with their team, and then perform well individually on the court. Although the Cavaliers were doing worse up until the trade deadline, many teams do bad immediately after getting new players. Basketball is a team sport, and it takes a unified unit. The Cavs got George Hill, Jordan Clarkson, and Larry Nance Jr., which are all decent role players. I think these pickups were more looking towards the Cavaliers' future roster, as I think at this point it was pretty known that LeBron was going out of Cleveland. During the rest of the season, really nothing interesting happened except for the Cavaliers once again signing Kedrick Perkins for the remainder of the season. So basically just for the playoffs since there was only one game left in the regular season. By the end of the season, the Cavaliers were 50-32 and 32 as the fourth seed in the Eastern Conference. This was the worst record that the Cavaliers had since 2014 when LeBron rejoined the Cavaliers from the Miami Heat. In the previous three playoffs since LeBron joined the Cavs, the team only lost five games in the Eastern Conference playoff side of the bracket, while winning 36 games. The 2017-18 playoffs was quite different. They lost six games on their way to the finals, more than the previous three seasons combined on the Eastern Conference side of the bracket. Although they almost lost to the Indiana Pacers and Boston Celtics, the Cavaliers did sweep the Raptors once again. LeBron was carrying his team, maybe more than ever. Averaging an almost 35-point triple-double throughout the playoffs says enough for itself. He was leading his team in every major stat category, except he was barely not leading in rebounds. Averaging about 10 minutes, 20 points, and 7 assists more than every other player on his team, there was nothing more that LeBron James could give. And then he had to face the absolutely loaded, maybe best team ever, Golden State Warriors. It wasn't even fair. After dropping 51 points in Game 1 against the Warriors and losing, the Cavs were done. No one expected it to be even close, and that was it. The Cavaliers got swept in the NBA Finals. A worn out, beat down Cleveland Cavaliers team that has not recovered since. With LeBron leaving the Cavaliers, we await the resurgence of a basketball team in Cleveland that can climb to the top of the NBA. By the end of that season, the Cavaliers had players they either kept or traded with added up accolades of 38 all-star appearances, five MVPs, 12 NBA championships, four finals MVPs, two rookies of the year, one six man of the year, two NBA scoring leaders, and one NBA assist leader. The Cleveland Cavaliers in the 2017-2018 season kind of had a super team, but it didn't really go their way. Do you think the Cavaliers could have done better in the playoffs if they stuck with the players they got before the season started and tried to build team chemistry? Like, comment, subscribe, and thanks for watching.